Woke up this morning at a Walmart. Yep, that's part of van life. In fact, yesterday I went to a campsite that was on BLM land and I pulled in and I always do this like once over look around. And as I did, I noticed that there was a lot of broken glass and there were a few needles left behind. And I was like, no, 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 we aren't staying here. So instead I decided to push forth a little bit further. Now the BLM land that I was looking at was outside of the Las Cruces area. And I was really excited because there's some cool stuff to do in Las Cruces. But between the fact that I found that and then I already had this just like terrible headache yesterday, I decided I would just rather move on. And so I found this Walmart in Dimming that I felt comfortable with staying at. It was a little bit closer to my end destination. So I checked on all stays to make sure they did in fact allow campers. I also checked on freecampsites.net, again, cross-checking, and here we are. I had a decent night's sleep. It's a little bit loud, but um, you know, it got the job done. So now we're off to our next adventure. Well, first I have to go in Walmart, but then we're off to our next adventure. Now, when I was reading the reviews for this place, I noticed that it said several people parked here every night. And so as I arrived, I started noticing, in fact, Several people do pull into the Dimming Walmart every single night to stay and that's okay. They just ask that you park away from the building. So I'm way out here by this little bushy area and uh, all is good. All is good. It is about 68 degrees as of this moment. It's supposed to heat up pretty hot today though. So I'm going to get some things that I need and try to just keep it moving. Now, one of the things that I did notice yesterday in all the craziness that was going on, one, I definitely am feeling the heat whenever it comes to how I feel on a day-to-day -day basis. So that means that we're gonna have to start hydrating even more than we already do. We need to start consuming as close to a gallon of water a day as I possibly can, because that just works for me a little bit better. Also, because of the heat and because of the winds, Arizona has been ravaged by wildfires overnight. In fact, in our group text, we got a little message from Riley saying that the campground she was going toward had been evacuated and the campground that she had been at had also been evacuated. So you're gonna have to go check out her channel to see exactly what happened with that. But um, I stayed up for the most part all last night, just checking to make sure everything on our path was going to be good because I did not want to be in a place that would put us in a bad spot while we're going down the road. So now that I feel a little bit more confident with that, we're pressing forward into Arizona today. But first, an adventure. Okay, we're collapsing down all of our boxes that we had from our recent purchases to save room in the fridge. And uh, then we're off. I picked up some more supplies because we're going to Weird Wild West and I knew that I would need a few more things. So I picked up some things that I didn't know if they would have there. So now it all has to fit in here like a little puzzle. Yay. And when I say a puzzle, it definitely is a puzzle because I still have more to go in here and that also. So, um, let me work on this. Okay, so that took a little bit of work, but we got it done. I pulled out my breakfast. I went ahead and condensed down some of the packaging and it fits like a little puzzle. Check this out, all the way up to the top. Yes. So now it's time to hit the road and get off to our adventure. Okay guys, so I had planned on going to the local museum here in Dimming. Okay, a change of plan. Rolling with the punches of the day. Um, I went over to the Dimming Museum because I was really interested in going there. It's one of the top rated things to go to other than the state park in the area. And I was very eager to go. It's very windy outside, otherwise I would take you guys to the state park because it looks super cool. But I think that we wouldn't be able to enjoy it very much because we'd be blown away. So when I went to the museum, I went to the door, I tried to turn the knob and it was locked. 
I'm not sure if I caught him at lunch or what the deal is, but um, yeah, we're not going to the museum. I could stick around and wait it out to see if it's maybe a lunch thing, but instead what I think I'm gonna do is I'm going to press toward Bisbee a little bit more. Now, yesterday, because of the fires and things like that, some people were saying one of the roadways toward Bisbee was closed. I've tried to find out which one of those roads it is, and I think it was the road that comes down by Tombstone, but I'm not sure. So I found another route to take. Let me show you. Okay, so the route over here is the one that I was talking about that I think has the closure or had a closure. It's now open, but that's where it was. So I decided that instead of dealing with that, I would go this way instead. And it is going to be a little bit faster also. It's about two hours and 54 minutes from where I am here in Dimming. And if we zoom in just a little bit, let's do that. You can see that as we're along this road, there will be a few different places that we might be able to stop along the way. I'm not sure yet what all lies across this road. I have stayed at Lordsburg before at a truck stop there before, but otherwise, I don't know that I really saw too much along this way because I was just on a mission to drive. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go just past Lordsburg, we're gonna drop down, and we're going to cross over into Arizona and go all the way down to Douglas, which is right by the Mexico border. And then we're going to go back up and into Bisbee. This should get us around all of the craziness that's going on in the drier areas up here but we shall see. Now along the way, I also checked in with my little group text. Again, I encourage you guys, if you have travel friends, to make a group text. That way you can check in on everybody all at once to make sure everybody's fine. The people who are coming to the Weird Wild West, which are Riley and Dee, I did make sure that they kind of knew that I was already gonna go and kind of scout ahead to make sure everything was fine so I can do a follow-up with them to let them know what my overall impressions of the road route that I am taking are. Now, Riley being in Arizona already, this will not be the most practical route for her, but it might be for Dee, so I'm gonna let her know one way or the other. But also I have another friend, the Nomadic Nanny, who is already in Bisbee, and so I want to get there so that we can hang out a little bit before the event starts. I'm super, super excited about this adventure because this is the first time I'll get to really hang out with Nomadic Nanny, and so it's gonna be super fun. So, with that said, with all of our change of plans, let's get back on the road. It is a windy, windy day on this road, and I can definitely see how a fire ban would be very important on a day like today especially. A little spark could ignite acres upon acres just really rapidly. So yeah, I understand. I definitely understand. Well, there's definitely some construction going on on I-10 going eastbound. So there's a little bit of slow progress, but slow progress is better than no progress. But I can definitely see a line of people kind of wrapping around, definitely not going the speed limit. <laughs> Glad we're on this side. Okay, I just stopped off at the Fly and J in Lordsburg, and I decided to go ahead and get some gas because I have no idea what is ahead of us. Gas, as expected, is getting a little bit more expensive as we go closer and closer to Arizona. In fact, here it is 429 at the pump. But I do have something that I wanna share with you guys that could help you at least a little bit with alleviating some of the pain at the pump. 
each individual truck stop has their own version of a rewards card and I definitely encourage you guys to look into these because what they do is they allow you to use this at the pump and for each gallon of gas that you get it tracks that so that you can keep up with that but then you're offered various kinds of rewards and to access those rewards all you have to do is log on to their app now when you log into the app not only can you see what kind of fuel rewards you have but you can also see other rewards for example I'm currently saving three cents on every gallon so while that is a tiny savings it's still a savings and every little bit counts right it will update and track how much that you have saved on fuel as you kind of go I just started using the fly and J and pilot fuel card but I've been using the loves one for quite some time and have racked up quite a few savings now also included are different kinds of other deals for example right here they have what's called the pilot drink club for every coffee that you get you get a little tick mark here as long as you scan your little code and then after so many you get one for free but that's not all also on the app you'll find something called offers offers are available only to those who have the card and you can see here that there's a variety of different kinds of offers for example one of the things that I do enjoy getting at the different truck stops is fruit cups a lot of times if I can't get near a grocery store they have great fruit cups and here you can get a fruit cup for only two dollars which is a considerable savings from their actual price but in addition they have tobacco offers monthly in-store discounts that vary from store to store and then jerky pork rinds um, they have Bluetooth headsets they even have cooler beverages where you can get two of them at a discount they also have it's cold brew day so you can get a cold brew for only $1 now it may not seem like much to get those kinds of discounts and offers and things but if you go into truck stops frequently and you're using that card to get those discounts it adds up and also it can go toward shower credits sometimes they will reward you with special things for example our friend Casey she ended up with a month of free showers at Love's truck stops as a result of just swiping her card when she'd get gas or whatever she needed in the store so it is very handy and very valuable and I definitely encourage you guys to look into the various cards yeah it takes up a little bit more room in your wallet but the nice thing about about it is with most of the cards you can sync them to your phone also so they're in your Apple wallet and then you can just go and scan your phone as opposed to having to rummage through and find it so I thought that I'd like to share that with you all um, I'm about to go into the store to see if there's anything that I need for this long drive I think I'm pretty good but we will find out not to mention truck stops are a great place to take a bathroom break Okay, I decided while we're driving, I might as well be charging the Blue Eddy. I used about 20% of it last night. So, here we go. We're going to charge this. I have it just plugged into the input directly into my port in the pit of despair. Or the point of no return here in the van. And so, I'm just going to let it sit very comfortably in the seat right here. And we're off. Now, as we're driving, this particular area has signs up year-round talking about how extreme winds kind of pass through this area. And because it is a very dusty area, it can cause limited visibility. So at any given time, whenever you're coming through here, they ask you to turn on your headlights because it just makes it a little bit safer. And I can definitely see why, because there is a lot of haziness in the air today as a result of the dust because the winds are very much so going strong today. Um, there's also a few little dust devils that I can see that I can't quite zoom in for you guys to see while I'm driving but there are like dust devils all in the distance and for those of you who don't know what a dust devil is it looks kind of like a little tornado of dust that's what it is and it just kind of drops down and spins around and doesn't really do any damage but it definitely has a lot of dust that it kicks up that can be pretty bad for the allergies so when you're going through i-10 you can just expect to see those kind of signs and that's why 
but in addition to those dust devils and the high winds there are also signs that tell you what you should do if you encounter a dust storm that's limited in visibility you're supposed to pull off stay buckled in stay in your car turn your car off and wait for it to pass it's very dangerous to drive in the limited visibility that you will have because it's not like just regular fog it is literally dust slamming your windshield creating near impossible driving conditions Okay, I pulled off because I found something super cool in the literal middle of nowhere. I've been driving for like what seems forever without seeing any kind of civilization whatsoever. And all of a sudden there's this really awesome looking museum in the middle of nowhere. So I think we're gonna go in and check it out. But first I'm gonna put on some regular shoes because I think there's some outdoor things and I definitely want to protect my toes just in case. Also, something that is a bit concerning, it says live exhibits. And there is a very large snake tail coming out of the ground as a huge statue. So this may be one of those things that we can only look at part of, but um, let's go check it out. Cool art, creepy art but uh very interesting also tesla charging stations in the middle of nowhere what so uh this is gonna be wild there's a cactus garden out here this is very nice let me show you a little bit of that and then we'll go inside Okay guys, we paid, oh, oh, it's bright, it's bright. We paid for our admission, and also I went ahead and picked up a patch. I'm going to go back in here in a minute to the gift shop, but I wanted to make sure I did those two things. Now, a couple of pieces of information. She said there are, in fact, live snakes in this main building right here, but the museum itself is in this building, so we're safe. We don't have to stress out. And she did say that inside this building over here where there are the live snakes, there's massive terrariums with tons of different ugh, creepy crawlers. But instead we're going into the Geronimo Event Center and the Apache Museum. This is gonna be awesome. There's some really amazing Native American pieces in here. And I'm just gonna have to like deep dive into a few of them and share them with you all. But I think first I'm gonna go and get a good visual to figure out where we need to start this tour because there's a lot of amazing pieces just right and left. Wow. And this room is the Geronimo Event Center. This thing is huge. 
Now she did tell me whenever I was getting my ticket that as you go around the event center, there are these signs and these are a timeline. So we'll be able to trace the story all the way around the event center and back into the entryway right in this door right over here. So I think that's where we should start, the timeline. The timeline takes up the vast majority of this particular room. So let's go find a few interesting facts. It looks like by this first entry door, we start off in 1870. And the first thing that we see is the last former state of the Confederacy, Georgia, is remitted to the Union. And the Confederate States of America is officially dissolved on July 15th, 1870. So that's setting the context for what is to come. In 1871, it says historians believe that Ja and his warriors killed Lieutenant Howard Bass Cushing on May 5th, 1871. And that was in Southern Arizona. So that's kind of, again, where we're starting out. And as we're going through, we're going to see the story of Geronimo. But along the way, there are some other interesting facts like this one right here. The first zoo of the United States was opened in Fairmount Park in Philadelphia, July 1st, 1874. Wow, that's pretty cool. And then they have corresponding pictures as well. This is neat. Now around this time is whenever Ulysses S. Grant actually started the process of reservations for Native Americans. They were pushing everyone to patches of land and taking them off of their native lands. And about this time is when San Carlos Apache Indian Reservation was formed. Now this has a significance to it. The reason why is because Geronimo was actually affiliated with this particular reservation. In fact, if we follow this to 1876, we notice that Geronimo and his followers broke from the reservation and headed to Mexico. Not even one year later, Pancho Villa was born. So a lot of names that a lot of us have heard in our history books are playing out within just these first two signs and putting together the context of not only how the reservations were formed and how some of the revolts started to happen, but also some of the other key figures in some pretty large conflicts. Let's keep going. It says here that Geronimo and his group actually escaped more than once. They escaped the first time in 1876, then again on 1878, and then again on 1881. Also in 1881, the gunfight at the OK Corral, regarded as one of the most famous shootouts in all of the Wild West history, began not too far from here in Tombstone. In addition, the Sioux Chief Sitting Bull led the final group of his tribe. This is Sitting Bull right here. He led the final group of his tribe, still fugitive from the reservation, and surrendered to the U.S. troops at Fort Buford, Montana. Now this particular chapter of history is a very dark and ugly one. When we go through and we look at all the factual evidence that we have of the conflicts that were happening and the upheaval, you can see that people were not being treated very well. And it was all for more land. More land. In fact, the very land that we are standing on right now was at one point in time just free roaming for the Native Americans. They were able to come here and source things off of the land and use them and be able to take advantage of what was here. But people wanted to move in and with progress comes conflict. And so as we kind of go across here, it's telling us about some of the larger figures of the Native Americans, which don't get near enough coverage within our history books. Typically, we want to paint the history books to be very white knight, good, the good guys versus the bad guys. And it's not always that simple. In fact, there's a lot of lines that get very blurred in interpretation when it comes to what we learn in our public school system. So coming to places like this, you get to see the true history. And I really appreciate that because then it gives you a different level of value that you can take away so that you can kind of understand the context of what really was happening instead of just the watered down whitewashed version. So let's keep going. There is also a map here and this shows a corner of Arizona. And this is 
the Apache and Tombstone Posse movements. So each one of these areas shows you a different group or a different conquest of movement. So for example, the blue is the Posse return route to Tombstone. This route right here is the Apache escape route. And each place that you see one of these is actually an engagement. So this was an Apache engaged the army South Pass and fought until dark, leaving the area during the night. Again, another map. This one is Captain Crawford's mission to nab Geronimo, and it shows his movement and then ultimately the various parts of the conflicts and the positioning. So the conflict took place here, and it was January 10th and 11th. The Americans joined the scouts to attack the camp. Some 80 hostiles, including Geronimo, escaped, but Crawford's men captured all the provisions and the stolen stock. Now in a time well before guns came to the West to even the playing field, the Americans who had come here had already armed themselves. So they were fighting with less primitive tools and so they could make a bigger impact with fewer things. However, the Native Americans were fighting with what they knew the land. They were fighting with the tools that they had, which weren't necessarily as fancy, but got the job done. And so that's why some of these conflicts were ongoing. It wasn't one of those things where they were just going to back away because they didn't have the boom booms, you know? And so as we kind of look around, here is a case of some of the different kinds of things that might have been used at that time. This is a Smith & Wesson lemon squeezer, circa 1880s. And then as you kind of go along this, you'll notice there are little broken pieces of various pots that would have been Native American. This is a Smith & Wesson 32, 20 caliber, circa 1900s. A John Browning 32 cal, 1899. And then we also have some of the shackles and handcuffs that would have been used around those times also. And I think this is neat because whenever you're looking at this, you're able to see who donated these to the museum so that we can learn a little bit more. So we're very appreciative to all the people who have made these donations so we can learn today. Around the floor of the room, there are various grinding stones that they would have used at the time. And these were used in a lot of different Indian villages in order to grind down grains, to create other kinds of things that they could use. On this map, we see on June 17th, 1886, Geronimo got trapped in a cave. And this was actually below the border in Mexico. Continuing to follow our timeline, 1889, the first Wall Street Journal was published. Wow. Up here, it says legislation was also passed in 1889 by President Grover Cleveland that set aside the first public lands to protect prehistoric features at Casa Grande. Now, when we get to the 1900s, that's when things start to really change on the political landscape. In fact, we had a president who was assassinated around this time, and as a result, our vice president became our president. And it's a pretty familiar name that you're going to definitely remember when I show you. Do you recognize this guy? This was Theodore Roosevelt, and he became the president after William McKinley was assassinated on September 6th, 1901. He remains the youngest president in our nation's history. Now, Roosevelt did a lot of things, but one of the things that he started out by doing was by talking to the people and telling them that he wanted fairness and he wanted to bring about change that would ensure that the average everyday person was treated a little bit better. Now, again, this was the early 1900s and you can kind of look at today and know that it didn't exactly work out how he planned it, but that was the beginning of a lot of changes. In fact, in 1905, it says right here that Geronimo had his most notable public appearance. It was whenever President Theodore Roosevelt had his inaugural parade in Washington, D.C. He was flanked by five other Indian leaders. There was an overwhelming amount of support as people were screaming out, hooray for Geronimo, 
Hooray for Geronimo. Five days later, though, the Indians got a chance to speak to Roosevelt in person at the White House. Getting an opportunity to be able to speak to the president when you're imprisoned is something that just doesn't happen. And at this time, he took this moment to plead with the president to please send his people back to where they were and to release them and to not govern them with such an iron fist, like had been done all the way up to this point. Geronimo had been imprisoned for about 20 years at this point, and the president heard him, but he declined. He declined because he was afraid that it would start a whole new war. And because of that, Geronimo's words, though powerful, became obsolete. They became something that were disregarded, again, showing that there wasn't really fairness. We can progress through a bit more of the timeline. However, I want to stop off at 1909. In February of 1909, Geronimo fell from his horse while riding home. He had to lie in the cold all night before someone actually found him. He later went on to die of pneumonia. Now at this point, he was in Fort Seal, Oklahoma, and he never got to find out the ultimate conclusion of what happened. In fact, only four years after he passed, the people were declared free. Man, sad, super sad. Now again, as we look through the timeline, it shares a variety of different events that have happened. And some of them are very positive. Others are just sad, like this. But it's interesting to see how the juxtaposition of the good and the bad kind of come together and create the timeline that we're seeing in front of us. For example, Roosevelt, while he didn't come through for the Native Americans, did provide a wonderful service for many of the public lands. There's a lot of controversy and debate still about some of that, but for example, he protected the Grand Canyon. He made it into a national monument. Of course, national monuments, national parks, they are all falling under the Antiquities Act, which means that they cannot be taken from. In fact, if you get caught taking something from one of those, you can get in a lot of trouble, guys. A lot. So some of the things, very good. Others, very unfortunate. By 1912, New Mexico officially became the 47th state of the Union. And January 6, 1912 was the day that it was officially granted this. Arizona went on to follow February 14th of 1912, and it was the last of the lower 48 to be admitted into the Union. So the question is, what happened to the Apaches following their release, their freedom? Well, many of them ended up staying in the Oklahoma area, and we visited numerous Oklahoma stops along the way to learn a little bit more about some of the history that they have found and planted in that area. So I definitely encourage you guys to tie all the sites together whenever you're traveling. And remember that places like this are an awesome resource for us to learn those details so that when we visit other detailed places, it kind of paints the bigger picture and we learn so much more. Now, as we walk across the event center, you see all of these different taxidermied animals also, but some information about the taxidermy through photos is available also. So as you look into the cases, don't just look at the animals, look at kind of the process. Some of these are magnificent and I prefer my animals walking and breathing, but sometimes if something unfortunate has already happened and we can use this as a learning tool, it's okay. We can come here and see what these beautiful animals look like close enough where we're also safe. So there's a pro and a con to each of these situations. Like this. I likely would never be able to get this close to a barred owl. But right here we can see it in all its majesty. Each individual feather, how the beak lays. It's just magnificent. And I certainly am never going to be able to get close enough to a marsh hawk to be able to see that vibrant yellow. Wow. 
And not only that, it's echoed into its feet. Look at those talons. And this bear, as cute as he is, would not be safe enough for me to be this close to a live bear. Now today we started our journey way over here in the 1800s, but what was before that? Well, along this wall over here, we find out. In fact, this starts us out at the earliest dates that would have led us down the timeline to make it over to that wall over there when the 1800s started. It is here that we learn about the first humans and how they might have made it to where we now call home. It also shows us some of the predators and how they would have hunted those, some of the pottery that they used and why they used those particular things. And then, just like we were talking about, look, right here, as early as 8500 BC, these tools were being used. This location right here is at Chaco Canyon, and I've actually been there on one of my earliest travels. This particular room was said to have over 700 individual spaces that they allotted. And in person, this is even more magnificent to see. Another location we've been to, Mesa Verde, or Mesa Verde. Here, people were known to live on the cliffs. And they built these intricate rooms into the sides of mountains that seem as though there would be no way to even get to them. The native people were living here far before any of us were. In fact, Christopher Columbus didn't step foot here until 1492. And all of this part of history, where we clearly have recorded that people were here, happened before that. So it's pretty interesting to see how cultures have changed and evolved before the uh, Europeans came over. So let's keep going. Now this is the part of history where we more often start picking up and learning in school. We learn about the explorers and how they came over from a variety of different places like this right here. This is actually one of the trade routes and voyages routes. It shows how people came to the land, where they landed, where they came from. And then also, as we continue to go down, it tells more about each one of the conquests and the difficulties that they had even getting to the now Americas. In addition, we learned that Harvard was the first official colonial college here in the United States. And so they have been around since like the beginning of all of this. In fact, right here, Harvard was founded in 1636 and in 1642, Yale followed way. But all of this happened before we even had a declaration of independence. It's crazy to think that there was institutional learning here in the United States before it was actually considered to be a free place to have things so so that's wild in itself but as we continue going there's some other things that might blow your mind just on the time frame of course george washington came along after the declaration of independence and after both harvard and yale which doesn't make a whole lot of sense in the timeline of what we would think of but yeah that actually happened and then in 1791 the bill of rights so our original declaration was way back in 1776, and it took them about 20 years before we had the Bill of Rights. Now right here is when we get into the earliest of the 1800s, and this is when Lewis and Clark started their expedition. At this point, no one knew what was Western. Nothing, nothing about it at all. And they were mostly living and starting to overgrow the area that they were in in the East. So they wanted to push forth and find out what was out there. And I have been to several Lewis and Clark stops also. It's fascinating to see what you can learn at each one, again, and how it works into the bigger picture whenever you stop at all the different places. Now, Lewis and Clark was just the first of many explorations, but it was the first one to make it all the way over to the West Coast that we know now. And whenever they got there, everything that they had to do along the way, they had to be able to do along the way because they could take very limited supplies. It was said that the people who went along with Lewis and Clark actually were considered to be, the more modern day term for them would be army rangers. But at the time, they were just really resourceful, 
people who could build things, who could create things using very minimal tools and who were able to kind of forage off the land. So that was, that was way back then. And then we finally get to 1825. It was in this year that this person right here, which I would pronounce Victorio, but this is the pronunciation that we should be using, was born. He was a famous and important warrior amongst the Apaches. Now, just to show you kind of how much that history gets skewed throughout the years because of either limited knowledge or limited resources, the photo that we just looked at was thought to be this person for quite some time. However, later on, it was disproved that this was that person. So it's wild to think that for many, many, many years, everyone was under the impression that this was the Apache warrior that we just named. But in fact, we have since learned that it is actually a Yavapai Apache and a totally different person. Four years later, Geronimo was born and his name actually meant the one who yawns. And he was born and then a few years later, as a young boy, he learned how to hunt and he was around his tribal elders learning different kinds of skills. Around 1885, Geronimo went from learning from his elders to actually being a part of the warrior council. He was only 16 years old when this happened, and so he was very young, yet he was extremely experienced already at 16. By age 18, he was married to his first wife in 1847. They ended up having three children together, and this is a photo of his wife and one of their children. Now, there were many conflicts which started around this time, and Geronimo has a quote on this wall right here that I wanna share with you. Again, I'm just kinda going over some of the bullet points. You're going to have to come and fill in the blanks for yourself, but look at this. Late one afternoon, when returning from town, we were met by a few women and children who told us that Mexican troops from some other town had attacked our camp. They killed all of our warriors of the guard, captured our ponies, secured our arms, destroyed our supplies, and killed many of our women and children. Quickly, we separated, concealing ourselves as best we could until nightfall. When we assembled at our appointed place of rendezvous, a thicket by the river, Silently, we stole in one by one. Sentinels were placed, and when all were counted, I found that my aged mother, my young wife, and my three small children were amongst those slain. Now, can you imagine being Geronimo at that moment when he realized his mother, his wife, his children, all were killed? I, I couldn't even fathom that feeling. I couldn't even fathom that amount of loss. And that's what brings us to the part of the timeline that we started with. Now in this main hall, as you walk in, there's also a video that you will have to sit down and watch because I cannot share it. But it tells the story of Geronimo. And it's fascinating and something that you will not want to miss. It paints the entire story so it corresponds with the timeline that we just saw and fills in a lot of the blanks. Now that we've come outside, let's do a little bit of a recap. The video, the video again fills in all of the blanks, but one of the things that it definitely points out is that Captain Crook actually told Geronimo that if he would just settle down on the reservation, he could live a normal life and that everything would be okay. But the very minute that he tried to do that, they came in and started to cause havoc amongst the natives who did agree to go to that reservation in the first place. Now, by doing this, they snatched up all of the things they had worked so hard for, all of the crops that they had just planted, and then they started to enslave the Native American people. And that's why Geronimo said, enough is enough. 
and he took to his own to escape the reservation. Now, if you were a person at that time who was living in your land, free and clear, and then suddenly you were enslaved and told you had to go to a reservation, would you be okay with that? Absolutely not. Would you have been accommodating and have just tried your best to stick it out, make it work? No, you wouldn't have. So the Native Americans were doing what I think every single one of us today would have done. They would have fought back. And the fact that they killed his entire family, wow, that is a lot. But the story doesn't stop there. After Geronimo ultimately surrendered, that wasn't it either. No, in fact, after he had ultimately surrendered, they started to move Native American people to concentration camps where they were isolated from one another. They separated the men and the women and the children from one another and told them that they could no longer live their existence, even the way that they had been told that they could by the very government who had put them there. It is really sad to see this. And I'm really happy that we stopped in to the event center here and could learn this story a bit more. I hope that whenever we come to places like this, it triggers us to think a little bit and not just see, again, what we were taught. Because a lot of times it doesn't want you to know all of the really bad stuff that has happened to others. And I think that we could all learn that um, the golden rule wasn't always followed. People did not do unto others as they would have them do unto them. So now it's our responsibility to try to do that. And we can do that every single day by learning and educating ourselves and then spreading kindness. Okay, I did find something in the visitor center that was just absolutely epic, but I'm not gonna show it to you guys because I got it for my mom for her birthday. Her birthday was on the 19th, so by the time that I get back to Texas to kind of circle through on my way to my next trip, it'll be a belated birthday gift. So, uh, hi mom, I have something for you. And I did want to, before I pull off, show you where exactly this is. If you turn off onto I-80 and go down like you're going toward Douglas on your way to Bisbee, it is right off of the side of 80. 